Welcome to episode 144 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which is www.7, so the word all spelt out, S-E-V-E-N, health.com forward slash 144. A couple of times a year, I take on clients, and client work is the core of my business and how I spend the vast majority of my time. And after working with clients for the last decade, I feel confident in saying I'm very good at what I do. And yes, I help clients with various symptoms, but actually it's much bigger than just removing symptoms. These are struggles that these individuals are obsessed with and are defined by. Their problem has become how they identify and think about themselves. My clients have often worked with multiple practitioners and are on the verge of giving up, and it really isn't uncommon for me to be the fourth or the fifth or the sixth person they've come to. And where I see myself being different to others is by combining science and compassion. So I'm evidence-based in what I do and have a strong grounding in physiology and why the body is functioning how it is. But at the same time, I'm compassionate and I listen to the mental and emotional side of the client's experience and know that these aspects are of equal importance to health as the physical side of things. And one of the aspects I like most about the work that I do is how positive the process is. People believe that they're going to have to give up so much that it will be painful in so many ways, but they'll convince themselves that it's better for their long-term health. But what they find is that the change actually adds to their quality of life. They enjoy the change and their new life. Their physical, mental, and emotional health improves now, not in some distant, far-off time in the future. And after working together, my clients regain what they thought was impossible, having their period again, conceiving, feeling energized, purposeful and alive, and walking by a mirror without the dread of seeing their own reflection. I put out so much free material. The podcast is free, the blog posts are free, and while the free material I put out I stand behind, it is much more general. You have to discern what is and isn't relevant for you. But when we are working together, I'm the one who can sort through this and show you what is important, what is the low-hanging fruit, and what are the levers that will make the most difference. So if you want this kind of precision in helping you with your recovery for better health, now is your chance to work with me. If you're interested in finding out more, you can head over to www.7-health.com forward slash help, so H-E-L-P, and there you can read more about how I work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. Welcome to Real Health Radio, health advice that's more than just about how you look. And here's your host, Chris Sandel. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Real Health Radio. So this week on the show, it is another guest interview, and my guest this week is Kai Hibbert. So Kai is a licensed social worker, author of the novel Losing It, uh, body acceptance activist and motivational speaker, uh, when not providing individual and couples therapy or publicly combating mass media hypocrisy and body shaming, she uses her voice to give presentations promoting body positivity and to shed light on the issues close to her heart. Uh, Kai was first cast into the spotlight through her participation in and subsequent denunciation of the weight loss game show, The Biggest Loser. Uh, going through the program, she realized the negative impact the show had not only on her own life, but on society in general. And vowing to be part of the solution rather than the part of the problem, Kai has fought uh, often as the lone voice against unrealistic and damaging messages in the media regarding our bodies in general. Drawing on experience from her own journey, as well as her education in psychology and social work, Kai explores living healthy and happy with her body in a society that inundates people with the message that she shouldn't. Through well-researched and empirically backed discourse, she encourages people to think independently and critically about the messages they are being sent in the media. She urges people to be comfortable in their own skin, embrace who they are, and own the space that they take up in the world with both the good and the bad that follows, knowing this is the best step forward, uh, best step towards a happier, healthier existence. So I've been aware of Kai for for many years. I think I must have seen an article that she was previously featured in talking about her experience on The Biggest Loser. 
Uh, I then found her page on Facebook and, and have followed her ever since. And considering I'm saying I found her page on Facebook as opposed to on Instagram, that's probably an indication of the length of time I've been following her. So this conversation is really me getting to find out about her experience on The Biggest Loser. What led up to this, what happened while she was on the show, and then what's happened subsequently, considering uh, in her first interview after the show was over, she started to denounce it. Um, It is fantastic that The Biggest Loser has finally been pulled from the TV in the US, uh, but disappointing that it went on for 17 seasons and in many places around the world it is still on air. And hopefully this gives an insight into what a horror show it really is and was um, and the damage that it creates to the contestants' physical and mental and emotional health. Um, So with that intro out of the way, here is my conversation with Kai Hibbert. Hey Kai, welcome to the show. Uh, Thanks for taking the time to chat with me tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So look, you were a contestant on the third series of The Biggest Loser back in 2006, and you then subsequently become incredibly critical of the show. And so I definitely want to talk about your experience or or maybe your ordeal on on the show. But I guess to start with, leading up to the show and appearing on the show and your like sort of pre The Biggest Loser life, like starting with you as a child, what what was your relationship with food like? Um. So, hmm, I I don't even know if I would have said that I had a relationship with food as a child. It's funny. It's something that I didn't think about or explore until I was much older. I do know, um, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, like most people, that my relationship with food became warped when I was about in the fourth grade. Uh, my mother, uh, actually, uh, suffered from, um, exercise anorexia and then, um, you know, just not just, but standard anorexia. She was a very tiny woman for most of my life. She's about a 4'11 and, um, really, really struggled with, um, eating disorder and mental health issues. And so about fourth grade, um, she recruited me, I guess, to join Weight Watchers with her. And so from that point on, my, um, uh, my connection with my body and my connection with eating, uh, turned into that, you know, that yo-yo dieting cycle that, um, a lot of women and, um, a lot of men I'm learning to can relate to. Yeah. And so with, with that sort of the, what you described with your mother there, did you, did you know she had issues around food or was it around that sort of fourth grade that that kind of became apparent to you? How, how did you think about her, uh, her body and her relationship with food? I, I don't think that I, it's funny. I don't think I ever really analyzed or thought about my mother's relationship with food. I realized that my mother was sick. I didn't understand what it was rooted in or how it was connected with how she ate. Um, uh, right about before fourth grade, we lived in Hawaii. Um, I, uh, I'm from a military family. I'm a military brat. And then I served myself and now I'm married to military. And, um, at that point in time, we were stationed in Hawaii and my mother, um, I remember was so thin and so weak that, um, there were periods of time where I remember she was bundled up like in layers and coats and sweatshirts in Hawaii to stay warm. And, and she barely had the energy to like lift her head up off the couch sometimes. And, um, you know, some of that was her depression, but a lot of it was malnourishment. But what I really remember about food and a relationship with, um, you know, exercise and health and all of that is honestly the cyclical dieting my father had to do to make weight, um, almost every year for his, uh, PT test and his PT standards to stay in the military. That really affected me more, I think. And so how did then you, you think about your, your body, especially starting to go to Weight Watchers and then and throughout childhood? As an as a elementary school kid, up until the Weight Watchers point, and honestly, up until um, we PCS, that's a permanent change of station when you're in the military, it's a move uh, from Hawaii to New Jersey. I don't think that I really thought about my body much at all, other than like what I could do. Uh, I was an active kid. I liked to swim. I liked to boogie board. Um, you know, living in Hawaii was great. It was a playground almost all the time, especially if you like being outdoors. When we moved to New Jersey, um, that was the point in time when I started Weight Watchers with my mother. Also, it was a very, very different environment. Um, uh, as far as, you know, I think going into the upper grades in elementary school and then starting junior high, and especially as a woman, 
um, at that point as a girl, there, there's things you start to notice about your body or how you look in comparison to other people. And it's not something I really experienced in Hawaii. Um, I'm, um, I'm Hapa, as I say in Hawaii, or I'm mixed. My mom is Chamorro. She's from Guam. And my dad is this big, giant white guy. And so in, in the Polynesian community and the military community also that we were in in Hawaii, my size wasn't really an issue. I was built, pardon my language, kind of like a little brick shit house, And it was great. I loved, I loved being strong. I loved taking up space. It was part of my personality. It was part of who I was. And, you know, also being a military brat, when you move a lot, you, you have to stake out a claim and you have to stake out your space and who you are if you ever expect to, like, survive all those transitions. And then when I got to New Jersey, the idea of um, attractiveness and acceptableness was completely different. And um, that's when I started to get the messages from everyone around me that my, my body and my size was not acceptable. And um, uh, that, you know, there was something quote unquote wrong with me. And I, you know, I, I learned as I got older, so we PCS again to North Carolina and New Jersey was a really difficult experience for me living there. Um, it was also a lot of wonderful things, but there was a lot of difficult things about my body and about my shape and learning how to diet. And, you know, I found my diary from that time period and, and almost every page details like what I weighed and it's the saddest thing. And when I got to North Carolina, um, I experienced a complete shift in what the people in that geographic area felt att was attractive versus where I was in New Jersey. And so suddenly I had this attention, um, that I wasn't used to. And, and a thing that really clicked in my brain at 15 that I think helped me survive, even though I clearly didn't internalize it deeply enough or I never would have gone on the biggest loser, um, was that, you know, at 15 years old, I went from a, a geographical location where I was told repeatedly how I was wrong and how I was unattractive and all we did was move locations and suddenly I was being told how attractive I was and how desirable I was. And, and that helped me at least at that point in time to understand that not a single damn thing had changed about me, but what had changed was the people I was surrounded with. And, and at that point in time, I realized that if somebody tells me that I am attractive, if somebody tells me that I am unattractive, it says absolutely nothing about who I am and everything about who they are. And, and so, so with then the the Weight Watchers, did that then just start you on a on a constant stream of diets, or, or what did your dieting history look like after that point? I, I think it was off and on. Um, I I can't even remember how long I did the Weight Watchers thing. Um, probably up until the point where it bored me, and <laughs> I was I was no longer interested in restriction because my body didn't really respond to restriction. I'm like, I'm not genetically predisposed to be 4'11 and, you know, tiny, tiny, like my mother was. And, um, so I, I think that I didn't think about it again until, um, probably later on in high school. Um, I was a cheerleader, which, um, people who know me find that endlessly hilarious. Um, but I was, and I remember that, um, they had to alter, um, a skirt for me in order to it, uh, in order for it to fit. And, you know, once again, I felt like I didn't, I didn't fit in. I could, I could do the same thing as all the other girls were doing athletically, but they didn't have a uniform that would fit me. I mean, never mind the fact that the uniforms were probably from like, you know, 1972 and <laughs> the cheerleaders were required to sell candy to raise money. So the football players had new uniforms every year. Let's not even get into that patriarchal construct. But, um, I remember, you know, just the shame that I felt that, you know, they had to, one of the God love one of the other girls on the team's moms who was willing to sew and alter a uniform for me just so I could be a cheerleader. And so that probably, you know, put it into high gear again. And then I remember, I think like the, the following year, I couldn't decide if I wanted to, to do cheerleading again. I tried bunches of different things. I always did. I've kind of floated from thing to thing based on what interests me. And, um, they had changed coaches that year. And I remember that, <laughs> When I went to go try out for the squad again, I was told by this new coach that I should consider a different sport because I didn't, quote, look like what a cheerleader should look like. So that was the end of my illustrious career in cheerleading. And so what you, you kind of took that advice and, and moved on? Uh, yeah, but that had more to do with um, not wanting to deal with that woman as a coach than it did with feeling like there was something wrong with my body. Um, you know, I think it was just... 
it was an off and on thing for me. It wasn't anything that was, um, obsessive for me until I was on the biggest loser. And then it, then it became dangerously obsessive. And you mentioned about your mom having anorexia and, and exercise anorexia. So what happened in terms of your exercise habits and, and both sort of in your, in your childhood, but more in the, those teenage years, did you pick up her obsessive exercise habits? No, I, I didn't um, pick up her obsessive exercise habits. Um, definitely not when I was a teenager. I tried different sports. I tried different things. I'm not the most coordinated human being in the world. If you've <laughs> ever seen me dance, you'd know that. I did, however, um, when I left home um, and I went to college in Hawaii for the first part of my undergrad degree, I supported myself um, uh, by getting my aerobics instructor certification. Okay. And yeah, and then I continued to do that um, when I transferred to Alaska to work on my undergrad degree. And um, I had I had really unhealthy habits in that I would not eat like all day long. And I was working two jobs, including the aerobics job. And then I was running the aerobics program, which meant that if anybody had missed their class or their shift, I picked up their class. So there would be days that I was teaching like three aerobics classes a day. I was also taking 21 credits. I wouldn't eat all day. And then I would come home and eat anything I could find in the house, pass out and do it again the next day. Sounds, sounds fairly full on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, moderation was not my thing at all. Yeah. And so then how how did The Biggest Loser come about and, and you appearing <laughs> on that show? The Biggest Loser came about because I was in my 20s and I, I did a dumb thing and I decided to do a dumb thing very publicly. Um, I, I decided to go on a reality TV program I had never viewed. I understand that that's like a mind blowing thing to say. And anybody who hears that is like, you did what? Yeah. (laughs) Um, I never watched a single episode of the show before I went on. So I, at the time, um, I had just finished up my under my two undergrad degrees. Actually, I had received a full scholarship to law school and I had quit all of my jobs because I saved up enough money and I was killing time till I left um, Alaska for the East Coast to start law school. And um, because I'd had the, the eating habits that I had and I was taking really bad care of myself, I gained um, a lot of weight very quickly. Um, and it just, it wasn't anything, honestly, that was like super on my radar. It was one of those things that I was like, well, this is a change that's occurring in my body that'll write itself once I'm, you know, on a schedule and and acting like myself again, completely ignoring the fact that the quote unquote schedule I had was deprivation all day and then binging at night and over exercising. Um, I also lived with, um, one of my best friends at the time who was a fitness competitor And if you know anything about fitness competitions and yeah, okay. So I don't even have to detail that. And, um, she had seen the show and uh, she called me upstairs to her half of the house that we were living in. And she had just finished watching the finale of this season, um, of season two and was like, they're asking for videos and you would be great. And you know, the weight will fall right off you because you're used to exercising so much and you should try this and blah, blah, blah. And, um, instead of being like, you're an idiot and that's rude and insulting. I was like, yes, that sounds like a great plan. I should totally do that because it would be a great story to tell my kids. And then I sort of like promptly forgot about it. And, um, after going out, um, a couple months later, actually not even a couple months, I think the finale of that show was like in December going out for new year's Eve with a group of girlfriends and, um, not being able to find any clothing that fit and felt comfortable and attractive, um, uh, kind of soured the night for me. And, you know, because I was caught in a diet culture warp mindset of the fact that the problem was my body, not the choices available to me. I promptly got up the next morning, hung over, made a videotape, sent it off to The Biggest Loser and found myself on the show like four months later. What what was in the videotape? Do you remember what was recorded as part of that? Yeah, it was it was literally me hung over in my living room, bitching about New Year's and dancing. No lie, dancing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and so then can it take us through from, from there? So you then find yourself on the biggest loser or there's like a, a, a stage where you might be going on it. How, how does it all work? And I, I'm going to admit upfront. I know of the show. I've never watched it. Oh, that I want to give you a gold star for that. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so there is, so my season, um, was different than some of the other seasons in that it was, um, the 50 States that was their gimmick. 
out of the 50 states, only 14 of the states actually stayed on this big thing they called the ranch. And then everybody else went home and they were competing at home. Uh, the normal season of the show apparently is you just have 15 competitors from all over the country or 14 competitors and they stay on the ranch or in the house or whatever. So when I was flown to LA, um, by the biggest loser, um, I left with the idea of like, yeah, I'll see you in a couple weeks. This is, this is, I don't know what this is, but I'm sure I'm coming home. And, uh, there was this whole almost, I believe two week period where they, they put you through a bunch of tests and psychological evaluations and interviews. And, um, somehow I got chosen and I ended up one of the 14 people that stayed and ended up on the show. And so what happens then when, when you're at the ranch and how does it all start? So once, um, for my season anyway, I can't speak to anybody else's experiences or anybody else's seasons, but for mine, when you were selected at that point, um, you were literally cut off and isolated from, um, the rest of the world. They took our cell phones, they took our, um, computers, they took anything that let us communicate with the outside world immediately. Uh, also they, um, they had put us up in a hotel before and had told us to pack and all of that. And, they, I was upset. I'm, I'm chuckling because I had sent my clothes cause I'd been in this hotel for so long. I'd sent my clothes to be laundered and not all of them had come back. And I was mad panicked oh. because here I was this, like, you know, this, this girl in from Alaska in the middle of California heat. And my underwear was literally missing. And I was like, this is going to be a problem. I don't know if these people know about chafing, but it's a thing. <laughs> and, um, that needs to be handled. And anyway, so, um, the other issue that I was concerned about was, uh, you know, I hadn't called my parents at all to let them know what was going on or where I was. And I was like, Hey, production is, is somebody gonna let my parents know. And they literally at that point, um, they, you know, shut up, quit speaking. Cause they hadn't put the cameras on us yet. So they didn't want us like talking with one another or building relationships or anything dramatic or show worthy happening until they could control it. And so when I asked if somebody would contact my family, I, I basically got told to shut up and don't worry, they'd handle it. It wasn't until I, much later that I found out that my parents really had no idea where I was for like three weeks. So that was, that was kind of disappointing. Um, in addition, there were things like when we were finally able to get mail, it was opened and redacted. It was a very isolating, strange experience. Wow. And with the intention of trying to create like tension and strain within you guys? I, there was, I believe, well, yeah, of course, absolutely, because it's reality TV and they have to create a narrative. And if there's no drama, everybody's bored. Nobody wants to watch that. Nobody wants to watch happy people. Like that's, that's not a show that would be well rated in the States. I believe that there's somewhere in, in Europe that they've got a show that's like, it's just a train going across the countryside and everybody loves it. That, <laughs> that wouldn't work here. <laughs> like that's it just, it would not fly because it wouldn't make money or have ratings in the States. We, we crave drama over here. It's might be evident by our political process. Uh, but anyway, um, so they, you know, they deliberately would, you know, when they're giving you interviews, they ask you questions about things like, well, I'm not saying this happened, but if your housemate had said, how would you feel? You know, just to make you start questioning in the back of your head, like, wait, what did so-and-so say that about me? Did that really happen? Um, and then as far as the isolating you from the outside world, I, I think there were a couple different motivations for that. I believe that there are some people who were attached to the production that genuinely believed that they were doing a good thing. Um, and that by isolating us from our support system outside that they were actually isolating us from like quote unquote negative influences on our bad behavior that, that, you know, added to our issue of, and I hate this word because it, it stigmatizes body size as though it were a sickness, but our issues of obesity as they like to call it. And so I think that there were people attached to the production that thought it was, you know, for your own good and there were other people attached with the production that just basically didn't want to miss anything that was camera worthy. They didn't want you to speak to anybody at home unless, you know, they could catch it on camera in case you learned something, you know, groundbreaking about what was going on at home or you were going to have like an emotional moment. And then one of the other very serious concerns when, when I was on the show, again, I don't know what it was like in later seasons, they were always perpetually afraid you were going to give away show secrets. Like you were going to talk about how much weight you'd lost or who'd won what challenge or who had been sent home, stuff like that. So like, even when we were allowed to call home off camera and that took over a month before we were allowed to do that, um, there were five minute calls and you had to be watched by a production system the whole time. 
so basically you were in jail. I, I mean, yeah. When I think back on it, I'm like, oh, it was the world's most beautiful prison. <laughs> um, it's funny because I have, you know, people love to, you know, talk about stuff that they don't understand or haven't researched on the internet. It's fun. And so I've had so many people come to me like, you know, oh, you'd never cut it in boot camp. And what makes me laugh about that is um, actually after this whole experience, I joined the army. Um, so I've been through boot camp. So I can compare the two experiences <laughs> and, um, you know, they're both hard in their own way, but it, the biggest loser is like boot camp, but it's designed to make you paranoid and hate everybody around you and hate yourself. Whereas like the ostensible goal of, of, of real boot camp for the army was to break you down so that they could build you back up again and unite you as a team. There was absolutely no building you back up again, period with the biggest loser. So that was like, <laughs> that's the starkest difference between the two. So I love it when people like to talk smack at me about how I wouldn't make it through boot camp. Yeah, yeah. And so, so tell us then about, so, so what happened as part of the, the show starting and what, what did your days or your weeks look like as, as part of that? So, um, they, hmm, I'm like, how do I explain a day or a week there? Oof. How do you explain a place where you come to believe that a cup of black coffee is a meal? Like that's, <laughs> and then that you come to believe that, you know, three hours of cardio is being lazy. That's, that's how my days and, and my weeks looked. Um, I, I can tell you, I can tell you what a, a, an average weigh-in day looked like. Um, so uh, when, when you went to weigh in, um, on the TV show, I know you haven't seen it, but there's this giant fake scale that you get on and you know, it's a big hoopla and that's what the whole audience at home sees. What they don't realize is that we weighed in either the morning or the day before we're actually filming this and you weigh in on a big cattle scale and you're not allowed to see what the cattle scale says. And usually the 24 hours prior to this weigh-in, um, you know, after your weeks of like filming and interviews and countless hours of exercise and food deprivation, and then all the drama that comes from being exhausted and hungry and stuck in a room with a bunch of, or in a house with a bunch of people you barely know and producers stirring up drama between you during interviews, um, about 24 hours before the weigh-in, you would usually be encouraged by your trainer to start dehydrating. So, um, you would cut your water intake, um, either to very little or to nothing at all. You would not eat at all. Um, and then on the morning of a weigh in, we were out in the middle of the California desert. So it was very, very hot. And our gym, um, was a temporary structure built just for the show. It wasn't a real gym and it didn't have any air conditioning or anything like that. And so what you would do is you would get up you would put on, um, like spandex shorts and then a sports bra, a tank top, um, uh, like leggings and then sweatpants and then a t-shirt, a long sleeve shirt, a hoodie, a hat, zip everything up, put your, yeah. Right. I mean, it's like talking about it now. I'm like, Oh, you were, yeah, you were not quite right. But at the time it seemed completely rational. Um, so you would put on all this stuff you would head down to the non air conditioned gym. You would close up all the windows in the gym. And then you would work out for two to three hours, as long as you could stand it without drinking any water, with sweating as much as humanly possible. Then you would go back up to the main house and strip down to whatever you could to weigh in. Um, and, and that got, that got levels of bizarreness that I, that still, I'm just, I'm sitting here like staring off into space, thinking about this. Like you got so obsessed with what that scale was going to say and what might cause you to like, you know, not lose enough weight on it. That there were women literally when we were menstruating that would refuse to wear tampons because it might add weight to their weigh in. <sighs> okay. So, yeah. Yeah. And so then you'd get on the scale, um, and then they, they wouldn't show your weight. They'd look at it. And then as soon as you got off, you just pounded as much water as you could get into you because you were just desperately dehydrated. And so on, on average, then like how much exercise were you doing a day? It, it would depend. Um, they had a thing called, um, dark days and those are days when, um, cameras weren't, um, at the ranch watching you on those days. Um, you would think there would be less exercise, but there's actually more, um, because as the competition ramped up and you got more and more near the end and more and more, um, and I know brainwash seems like a really severe word to use for it, but brainwashed is accurate. 
um, you just ramped up your exercise more and more. So, and then there would be days when there was filming and you'd get interrupted almost constantly for interviews or having to, you know, drive somewhere and be at a location or do a challenge. And it was harder to get workouts on on those days. So it would average anywhere between like three and eight hours a day. Wow. And were there rest days? Um, I'm trying to think if I had a single rest day while I was there. God. Um, no, the closest thing we would have to, to a rest day would be like a rest few hours. Um, and that's when they would have a dark day and we would talk production into like taking us to go see a movie. And, um, the only reason people would agree to like rest during that movie is because everybody was there. So you could see your competition because you're so paranoid at this point that if you didn't see somebody, you were absolutely certain that they were somewhere else working harder than you and you better get up and start working too. But if we were all there in that movie theater, then we all knew everybody was sitting down at once. So it was kind of okay to relax, but those got completely ruined. Um, when at one point, um, at, at, during one of those trips, somebody went up to, stood up to use the restroom. And when they turned around, they realized there was another fellow contestant literally in the back of the theater doing squats. So we just stopped after that. And so is there psychologists or like <laughs> therapists or counselors or anyone on the show there? <gasps> checking in? Yeah, no. Uh, again, I can't speak to any other seasons because some other people, um, other contestants on other seasons say that there were the, the only interactions I had, um, with a, um, I guess a mental health expert, I I believe it was a side D. I believe the person was a side D was when they did the psychological evaluations at the beginning to cast you. And my personal opinion is that these evaluations weren't necessarily to make sure you were stable enough to endure it. It was just to make sure that, um, you were possibly going to be enough drama so that you were good for TV, but you weren't going to be so much drama that you would actively like stab a housemate. Okay. Um, I, I don't think that there was anything in there really to protect the, the contestants' well-being. Um, I do know that the other time, <laughs> excuse me, that this PsyD um, came to the ranch was one contestant was really, really struggling, and um, they only brought this guy to come out and speak to us because this contestant had to demand it for days and that he needed to speak with somebody. And so I remember briefly speaking with the the man and saying, look, you know, I feel like Alice through the looking glass here. Like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I'm not sure this is healthy. And, and the response was like, basically patting me on the head and, you know, you're lucky you're here. It's saving your life. And then I didn't see that guy again. I believe that some of the other contestants on my season might have seen that guy after they were eliminated, but um, I was one of the lucky or unlucky, I guess, depending on how you look at it, um, contestants to make it to the final four. So when I was like, quote unquote, eliminated, we were all just whisked off the ranch at the same time. And so there was no debriefing with the, with the side D at all. It was just like, oh, well, if you need him, you know where to find him. And I was like, but I, I don't actually. And, you know, they just left the room. <laughs> And then what about on, on, on the food front? What, what, what did that look like? I'm kind of horrified to ask. <laughs> so on the food front, there, there actually was, at the time I was um, connected with the show, a, um, I believe a registered dietitian attached to the show. And from what I've learned in retrospect, the 36 contestants who were competing at home actually had access to this person and this person helped them design diets and, um, you know, talk to them about nutrients and proper ways to eat and stuff like that. If you were an actual contestant on the ranch, while I believe we had like one, one or two interactions with this person, um, production would constantly intervene and tell you that the only person you were to listen to was your trainer, which is, you know, again, in retrospect, I'm like, why, why am I listening to this? fitness competitor for nutrition information, this, what? Um, and so for instance, like I can remember one of the guys at least being told to eat more calories by the registered dietitian. And then the guy's trainer coming like right behind that and a member of production, um, going, Hey, if you do that, you're going to, you're not going to lose weight fast enough and you're going to be kicked off. And if you get kicked off the ranch, you know, you're, you're risking your shot at saving your life. And the, (laughs) the other thing is, is we were told to keep food diaries, food logs, and the trainers blatantly told us to lie on them. 
and to, to lie and say you're eating more than you really mm-hmm. were. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, and it's funny, like every time I've said anything like this in a previous interview or, um, you know, in, in a magazine interview, it's always rebutted by, you know, um, one of the trainers or somebody associated with the show. And what's really funny to me is like, I've been making this claim for over a decade since I I left that show. And, um, one of the trainers on there, Bob Harper was like, Oh, I'd, I'd never do that. And then he literally came out with a diet book that recommended quote unquote, jump starting with eight, 800 calories a day. And I was like, well, there you go. Who is lying for over a decade? Me or you? <laughs> and so, and you mentioned before about like going to the movies didn't really work because everyone was wanting to watch if someone else was, was fitting in exercise. So yeah. in terms of the eating, were you guys who were at the ranch, were you all eating together? And did that have the same impact on like you saying that other people were eating less or just eating a salad and that spurred you on to eat less as well? No, I, you know, oddly enough, it's, it's funny what you're describing that whole phenomena. I've, I've really experienced that more off the ranch with like social circles of other women. When you go to lunch and everybody seems to be paranoid, like identifying or, or you know, playing this, who can eat the less competition, you yeah. know, I'm going to order a salad with dress, you know, Oh, well I want mine without dressing and I'll take that same salad, but without the avocado. And it turns into this weird who can starve themselves the most in order to achieve some false vision of virtuousness. Um, I experienced that more with social circles with, with other women than I did on the show on the show. Um, honestly, (laughs) where the eating came in for me anyway, um, was I pretty much, I just ate whatever was around in the sense that I'm not much of a cook. I've never been much of a cook. I'm still not much of a cook. If you ask my son, um, so if other people were preparing meals, I kind of was that person that was like looking over like, so what you got there? <laughs> What's that? Also, you to be, all of that? Exactly. Exactly. But, um, also to be honest, you know, there were so many sponsors associated with the show, uh, that were like food things that we were basically eating what was stocked in the kitchen. And at that point in time, um, you know, as opposed to the, the whole move to, uh, quote unquote, clean eating. And I hate that phrase. I, yeah, I try to same. stroke out every time I hear it and I get into so many online arguments about it. I'm fun that way. Um, but you know how that's the whole, that's the shtick now when, when you're talking about diet culture and weight loss culture back then, that wasn't the thing. It was all processed foods. It was so long ago that, um, you know, the fridge literally had like, you know, diet Mountain Dew and spray butter and, um, uh, like, uh, processed, uh, fat-free cheese in it. And so there was a lot of that and protein shakes. I, I had so many protein shakes. I, yeah, I, mm, I was, I was probably like 80% protein shake and coffee at some point in time during that whole experience. <laughs> and so how closely, is what is seen or what was seen in the show uh, versus what was actually going on? Um, uh, yeah, they're not in any way, shape or form. They, it's no. <laughs> yeah. Like, no. Uh, for instance, one of the things that I've spoken about before is the show presents it that weigh-ins happen like every week. And that's complete. That's a lie. That's a total lie. Uh, weigh-ins sometimes were just five days apart and sometimes they would be three weeks apart, um, depending on filming schedules. Um, see what other things were like complete lies. Well, I, I mean, one of the other things that were, was, you know, a pretty big lie is, um, the show has all these different, like, um, well, it used to, I, I don't know. I, I never saw it before my season. I never saw it after my season, but during my season, they would pop up these like health tips on screen or whatever, you know, recommending you should do blah, blah, blah. The contestants do blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was things that when I saw it, when I was watching the show air, I was like, we, we never ate that. <laughs> we, we never did that. That's not a thing I did at all. So no, what, what you saw on TV did not match what we were doing to our bodies at all, which is why, um, well, I mean, one of the reasons that I, I felt obligated to to be a whistleblower immediately after I um, after my family staged an intervention and I got through the whole process of the finale um, was because then you know I was doing um, I was doing speaking engagements in my local community where I would go when people asked me to speak and and talking to people and I remember conversations, especially with um, younger women because you know I was only in my twenties at the time and um, telling me that they didn't understand what was wrong with them because they couldn't do what I did on TV. 
And I remember just like the crushing guilt and being like, I, I wasn't doing what you saw me doing on TV. And it was, it was too much for my moral compass. I couldn't keep my mouth shut much, much to my own, my own detriment. Uh, I mean, if you ask, you know, NBC, but I've, I've pulled through it. Okay. I mean, I sleep, I sleep well at night. Thank goodness. Yeah. And so what was, I mean, you mentioned there about your, your family staging intervention. So what was going on with your health or what, what changes happened with your health as, as part of, um, being at the ranch and doing all the exercise and not eating very much food, et cetera. So it got, it got way worse actually. Um, so you haven't seen the show. So the premise of the show is you're on the ranch for a certain amount of time. And then once they get, whittle it down to like the final four, final three contestants, you go home for the at home portion of the show and you're supposed to continue the best you can at home. And then you come back for the finale and it's a big surprise. Like who did the best Oof, and the best is such a subjective thing. Um, and do, do you home, still have the trainer when you're at home or that, that all disappears? No, that all disappears. Um, uh, my, the trainer that was on my season, she called me, um, I think like once maybe, but there's, there's nobody really monitoring you, but the show, it's so funny because the show goes back and forth, um, <laughs> based on, on what they're trying to defend. Like, uh, the season of, I want to say it was like season 15 or something, but they had a winner who, um, uh, lost so much weight that, and, and, as a side note, I, I think that the BMI is a bullshit measurement of anything, but just for the sake of this conversation, they tried to justify the show and its methods by using the BMI as in like, these people were in an unhealthy range in the BMI and now they're in the healthy range for the body mass index. And so they had a winner that went from being what is considered, you know, upper regions of unhealthy on the body mass index to lower regions of unhealthy on the body, body mass index. And when that happened, they did interviews with the trainers who were like, you know, oh, yeah, but when they go home, we don't know what they're doing. It's not our responsibility. And then, like, at the same time, there's a big thing. There's a big disclaimer, literally, like, in the credits of every show that's like, don't try this at home. Our contestants are heavily monitored at all times by psychologists and doctors. And I'm always like, which is it, guys? <laughs> which is it? Yeah. So, no, at home, um, I like to say that um, basically, like, they, they would have been happier if I had gone home and, and done, you know, cocaine or something. Because I, I wasn't monitored at all. And they really, really wanted a female winner my season. And they were fairly hard pressing for it. And, um, you know, there wasn't anything to stop anybody from doing outrageous things to, to, you know, accelerate weight loss. And, and I like to say people get annoyed, but I like to say like, if I could have cut one of my limbs off and shown up at the finale and weighed in that way, if the nation wouldn't have noticed it, the show would have given it the thumbs up. Cause I would have won. That's, that's how little monitoring that we had at that point in time. And so, um, so at the point that I went home is honestly when my family staged an intervention, I had, um, I met, I met a guy, um, I met a guy who was my boyfriend at the time and is now my husband. And, um, he, <laughs> he was in Alaska and I was on the East coast, um, because I was preparing to get ready to go to law school and start what, you know, I thought was going to be my real life, but I had to fly back to Alaska occasionally to shoot for the show because the big shtick and the gimmick was, you know, 50 States and they love the whole Alaska appeal. And so one of my trips flying back, I got off the plane and, um, he took one look at me. And at that point, um, my hair had started to fall out in big chunks and I tried to hide it with a baseball cap, you know, but it was impossible. You know how people, you know, try to hide things like that. And then I was covered in bruises. Um, I had black circles under my eyes. I was only able to sleep about like three hours at night at a time. That was it. And then, um, I, uh, I completely stopped menstruating. My, my body stopped. And, um, so I think trying to remember the exact sequence of events, but I was so like malnourished and and just grinding myself to dust that there was one night I woke up in the middle of the night and I had such severe leg cramps, excuse me, in both my legs that I literally, like they literally threw me out of his bed and I ended up on the floor and the pain was so bad that I started vomiting. Gosh. And yeah, at that point in time, he was like, okay, cool. I'm done. I'm done. And, um, so he contacted my parents, he contacted my best friend at the time and her husband, and they all sat me down and they were like, all right, listen up. 
you're going to die. So no. And, um, at that point they really, um, they, they babysat me basically from that point until the finale. And I still, I still did incredibly dangerous things at, at my finale to take weight off. And that was, that was after even an intervention when they got me to start seeing a therapist and, um, they cut my workouts from about eight hours a day down to three hours a day. Um, I can remember, uh, my husband now, um, sitting with me and just like, waiting until I finished an entire meal. And, and I cry, I remember crying, just crying for the whole, the meal was something ridiculous, like half a cup of an oatmeal and some egg whites. And I just sobbed because he was, you know, quote unquote, making me eat the whole thing. And he was so patient. And he was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> he's, he's a very funny man too. He's very patient. And he was also like, you know, well, crying is just going to mean it's cold. We need it. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> he's like, so you might want to just keep eating, stop crying. Anyway. So yeah, they really got me through. Um, but you know, I was still so warped, um, that I still wasn't healthy. I, I wasn't healthy. I wasn't healthy until years later, almost would I say that I was on a path to recovery. And then even at one point, um, you know, I, I was on a really good path to recovery and I got pregnant with my son and that kind of messed with my head again, um, very badly. And I ended up back in intensive therapy because I had such a hard time with the very healthy weight gain that came from being pregnant. And so were you, when they did the, the intervention, were you then reluctant to, to be getting that kind of help where you were reluctant to oh, be yeah. reducing everything? Oh yeah. I was very, very resistant to it. Um, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a competitive person, which is a really strange thing to say, but what I am is, um, a pleaser and I cannot stand the idea of letting anybody down. And I, I was, I was prime bait for, um, the spiel I kept getting over and over from production that like, you know, 200,000 other people auditioned and we chose you and don't you dare waste this opportunity. You know, you were so lucky and 200,000 other people wish they could be you. And so the whole idea of not like fully doing every single thing, whether it was healthy or not to try and achieve, you know, winning this felt like disrespectful to all of those other people that wanted this opportunity. That really worked on my head. And that's what I had the hardest time letting go of. And so you came, you came second in the show. Um, I did. Yeah. <laughs> how, how did you feel about that? Like, were you, I mean, you said, I don't know, I'm getting the impression maybe you were disappointed about it or like there were so many other issues going on by that stage that it was just kind of past that point. It was by the time the finale rolled around, I knew I was going to come in second. Um, first of all, like the statistical odds of being able to beat a man, um, who was really my only competition and out of the final four contestants who started off so much heavier than I did. And with, with a bigger percentage, um, than I did, it would have been, it would have been near impossible. I would have had it when, when they finally like weighed me in and I went to my final doctor's office thing, they, they did a scan called a DEXA scan that shows adipose tissue versus, um, you know, muscle mass and bone mass. And the doctor had told me that I would have had to have lost, um, uh, bone mass and additional lean, uh, tissue in order to have won. So there was no way. There was so no you, way physically. You needed to get osteoporosis to win. Yes, yes, yeah. Or I needed to, like I referenced earlier, literally cut off a limb. So there was there was no way I was going to win. I'd, I'd already come to that conclusion before I got there. And um, so, th so that was fine. Um, uh, the blowback from some people about not winning was a little difficult. Um, you know, the whole you let people down, all of that. But honestly, there was... Um, there was a lot of relief with it because had I won, I would have been immediately whisked away um, to go do the rounds of, you know, the press and all of that stuff. And I was really locked into, and I still was even with not winning, but you're locked into this contract where um, you basically aren't allowed to tell the truth. And, um, you know, also you see interviews that you supposedly gave pop up in magazines and you're like, I never said that. I don't, it, it, there was one interview I, I read in later on in some magazine that quoted me as saying, I finally broke down my fat walls. I was like, what the hell does that even mean? That's not, that's not even something I would ever say. I don't, what? Um, uh, so there was a sense of relief in the sense that, um, you know, I wasn't still caught up in the big machine. Yeah. Um, so the first interview I was asked to give after the entire thing, um, 
I told the whole truth. And then, you know, and then I was sent a scary email about how NBC and the biggest loser were going to sue me for a million dollars. Luckily for me, um, all I had was student loan debt. So I was like, good, good luck. And I kept telling the truth. So. And so, yeah, I mean, was there some kind of non-disclosure agreement and, and, there was, there was a very ridiculous, um, contract and non-disclosure agreement that I had an attorney look at at one point. And, um, he literally laughed out loud at it and was like, yeah, um, I don't think that this was hold up in court. However, they have over a hundred attorneys and you can't afford me. So you're out of luck. Right. But, yeah. And so what, like once the show was over, was there any aftercare? I, I mean, I'm, I'm ex- <laughs> expecting the answer is going to be no, but what, so what just happened once, once it's over? Um, once it's over, they forget you're alive unless you can be profitable for them. Right. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's, that's the best, um, explanation I can give unless in some way they believe that they can still continue to profit from you. You no longer exist. Oh, or unless, of course, you threaten their bottom line by telling the entire world that it was unhealthy and unsafe, then they remember you because they send you letters to try to scare you and be quiet. <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, you mentioned about then speaking out about it. So how shortly after the show was that that you then started to, to voice your criticism? Um, the very first... I'm trying to think the very first interview that anybody came to me for was Time Magazine, and I believe it was... I think it was like five or six months after my finale, Time Magazine contacted me and they were like, so would you be willing to, and I was like, yes, I would. And so that was the very first one. Nobody between, um, December and then had contacted me at all. They'd all gone through like the press through NBC. And then, um, I believe somebody had tried to contact me. I don't remember who it was, but, but press through the biggest loser their representatives called me and was like, you are not to give any interviews without asking us first. And I was like, yeah, okay, then click. (laughs) Um, I, I, you know, and I also kind of went into hiding and recovery. I was very, very ill immediately after following the finale. I ended up in the hospital. Um, my immune system crashed and I ended up with, um, all kinds of things wrong, including thrush. So that was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what was the reaction when you did start to, to speak out? I mean, you mentioned obviously that the producers and the show weren't thus pleased, but what oh, was no. the reaction of the public? Uh, they responded as though I killed Santa Claus every time I gave an interview <laughs> because I ruined this like wonderful thing for people is how it was perceived. Um, you know, I, they, they literally acted like I slaughtered their dreams in front of them. I got, I got hate mail. I got death threats. I got, you know, I got the usual fun array of things that come on the internet. Uh, but I also got, um, uh, gratitude. I got, I got amazing private messages and letters and conversations from people who were like, thank you so much. I thought there was something wrong with me. I had resorted to things like not eating or vomiting my food to try and emulate the, the results that I saw in that show. And I couldn't figure out why I couldn't do it. And, um, you know, I also got, I don't, I don't think that I'm bitter about this, but, um, I I think the, the ones that confound me the most, when I think back about it, are, um, the fellow contestants that would, um, give interviews like after I had disputing everything that, that I had to say. And that always confounded me because I was like, but you know, I'm telling the truth. Like you were, you were there. Um, and you know, but as time went on, that changed a lot. I ended up being contacted by lots and lots of contestants because I mean, I was season three and that show didn't die until what? 18 season 18. I think it was finally killed. Thank goodness. Um, but I got contacted by so many contestants behind the scenes that were just like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was my experience. And, and I'd like to say that it got better in seasons after mine, but boy, some of the horror stories, it did not get better. Um, for a long time, it it in fact got worse. And so as, as the season went on, like more and more contestants started to, to speak out as well. Um, and not until I'm trying to think, I want to say it was like 2000 and geez, I want to say like maybe 2015 finally. Right. Okay. So quite finally, a long, like you're talking about oh, it nearly like basically oh, yeah. a decade. Yeah. Oh yeah. For, for over a decade, for at least a decade, I was the lone contestant out there talking about 
the truth, telling the truth about what the experience was like. And then finally, after a decade, um, others started coming forward. And um, then what really sealed the deal is the National Institute of Health here had done a, um, a research study on some of the contestants from season six, I believe. And was, it, was this the, like, the article that then like Gina Collada wrote for, for some some publication i think it was like like season eight contestants and it showed all their bmi uh, their uh, basal metabolic rate was screwed up is that yes, the one that's the one and when that finally broke um i was i basically anybody that called me i was like i told you you know and yeah so i felt really i mean i had a big big bowl of schadenfreude for breakfast that, <laughs> that morning when i you know had to watch uh you know trainers from the show react to that data it was amazing and I felt really, really vindicated um, when those results came out. And that was like the beginning of the end um, for the show. And I was like, you know, I've been, t- I've been telling you this for years and beyond the horrible treatment that, that we all experienced, um, you know, data does not support dieting at all, at all. And so because of that, um, you know, that, that was awesome. That, that's when the whole thing started to crumble and it was fantastic. And so tell me then more about sort of your recovery and then and what's happened after the show in, in terms of you mentioned about law school at some point. Did you go back and finish the law school? No, much to my parents' chagrin, I turned down a full scholarship to law school to pay to get my master's in social work. Yeah. I think that they still sometimes like occasionally I was like I could hear my father still like screaming in the main woods, you know, where they live in in horror over that decision all the way up until I gave them a grandchild and then all was forgiven. They were pretty happy campers. <laughs> yeah. So no, I, um, I instead, um, I joined the army, like I stated for a little while. Um, I did that mostly because I wanted to serve my country. Cause like I said, um, I come from a family that serves my, my grandfather, um, from Guam, uh, served in the Navy. He, um, was a prisoner of war, uh, and he served in world war II. My father served in the United States coast guard, I served in the army and then, um, my husband served, um, in the United States air force and in the United States coast guard. And he's now in the United States Navy. And so I served, um, and then I, um, paid back my student loans, which was another reason that I wanted to serve. Thank goodness. Um, and I was uh, discharged because I broke my pelvis. I was injured. And, um, uh, then I found out, what is it? 2018. So three and a half years ago that I have rheumatoid arthritis and I have fibromyalgia. So I'm living with a chronic illness right now. And I'm working as a, um, social worker in clinical practice. I do, um, I do therapy. I am somebody's therapist. Wow. And in, in what area? Um, right now I work, um, with the court system. Uh, I work with parents who are getting divorced and children who are coping with it and, um, helping them with co-parenting and helping people adjust to life being divorced. And do you think like your time on the show and that, that experience like pushed you into wanting to do social work or do something different? Um, I think that like, honestly, um, I was a born social worker, <laughs> but it's who I am. Uh, it's why, you know, after the whole experience, I immediately started, you know, yelling, this isn't right. Um, at the top of my lungs, social justice, uh, as much as it's, you know, mocked in some circles in the States is it's who I am at my core. Um, and I think that after going through that experience and, you know, just, learning that I had been inculcated in diet culture my entire life. And then also learning what it's like to live in the United States as a, uh, Chamara woman with Chamara heritage who looks white and the privilege that comes with that. And then the layers of marginalization that come with being a fat woman and, um, a woman of color and, um, a bisexual woman, like it just, it made sense for me. It made sense for me more than being an attorney did. And to be quite honest, um, during my undergrad, I I worked for a couple of attorneys and none of them were happy. (laughs) And after that whole experience, I, I put a high, high, you know, amount of, uh, of preference in in, in being happy. (laughs) And did you, I mean, get into the, the health at every size and I don't know, looking at weight bias and weight stigma as part of your recovery. Is that how you got into that? 
Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. The whole, um, you know, the, the more I studied social work on my master's degree and the more I looked at, um, layers of marginalization and intersectionality and the actual data and statistics about, um, you know, what fat people in the States at least face, um, you know, we're discriminated against academically. We're discriminated against economically. Um, we're discriminated against when we go to the doctor. I experienced it myself trying to get my diagnosis for rheumatoid arthritis. It took me two years because doctors kept wanting to diagnose me as quote unquote fat, as opposed to listening to me. Oh, well, you know, your joints just hurt and they're just red and swollen because you're too big for, you know, your joints. Um, no, nope, pretty sure that's not it, guys. But it took two years to fight that bias and stigma. And um, so I think that, you know, my experience on the show and then the education that came afterwards that helped pull me out of, you know, that whole diet culture mindset and, and really look at the reality of, um, you know, what what needed to be changed and, and coming around to, you know, I don't want to change my body. I want to change the world. And that's always who I've been. And that just makes more sense in social work. I mean, one of our tenets of our profession is to always be involved in activism. And am I also correct that you've done some like peer reviewed research and, and uh, like to do with, with weight? I have, I have two um, peer reviewed academic um, articles published um, because I had the distinct privilege of being contacted by Dr. Moore, um, who was at Mercer University at the time and is now at Alliant University in California, who asked me if I would be willing to um, be on his research team. So yes, I have two peer reviewed academic articles articles published. And, um, I'm hoping that those come in handy when, well, if, and when I decide to pursue getting some more fancy letters after my name. And, um, and I also have, um, I have a book out on Amazon, which is a, um, fictionalized reimagining of my time on weight loss reality TV. And so it's a fictionalized version of everything that I went through. Okay. And when you say fictionalized, is mm. that just a, a way to get out of the, the, the non-disclosure and it's, it's fairly, fairly true? If, if it were, I wouldn't say that because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you, you just have to read it and let me know what you think. Okay. <laughs> it's called losing it. Um, so look, this has been, been wonderful. Is there anything that we haven't covered that, that you wanted to, to go through? Um, uh, not that I can think of, except that, um, and I can, uh, when, like, I'm trying to think of the best way to do this because I know I'm going to butcher everything. I, I also have ADHD, so, you know, shiny objects. Uh, <laughs> what I wanted to do was, um, just give like a list of, um, people on social media and like podcasts and resources, um, other than your own, obviously, clearly, which is a fantastic resource, um, that helped me, um, and books that helped me and peer reviewed articles and, um, people, because I think it's really, really important, especially in, um, you know, looking at health at every size and looking at fat acceptance and, um, you know, fighting, um, oppression based on weight bias turning to the voices that are out there speaking. And, um, you know, sometimes the people that garner the most publicity or get the most opportunities for a platform are not necessarily the people that have the greatest information, myself included. Like I, you know, I love getting out there and, and being able to speak and I keep trying to inform myself, but, you know, often, um, unfortunately we turn to people whose like first vocation is modeling, for instance, and we look at them to be the beacon of information for this. And that's not necessarily where we need to go. Um, so off the top of my head and apologizing for anybody that I forget, um, I want to say that there are fabulous people out there to look for, especially on social media that are excellent resources like Virgie Tover, um, uh, Melissa Toller, um, uh, Roxanne Gay, um, uh, your fat friend, um, is the name on social media. Um, I know I'm forgetting a bunch of wonderful people. Um, uh, Lindy West, um, uh, Ijeoma Oluo, um, uh, and that is the best I'm going to be able to do. Oh, clearly Linda Bacon. Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, but that's the best I'm going to be able to do off the top of my head, but, um, look for them. They're out there. And these are the voices that you need to hear that will help you when you're trying to get through everything that's being thrown at you, especially this time of year. January is the worst for diet culture. Uh, I've had Virgie on the on the show before. I also <gasps> recently had Jess 
Baker on and we, we yeah. talked a bit about this as well and, and she's got a, a fantastic selection of resources of different Instagram accounts to follow, different yes. books, etc. Yes, I forgot to mention Jess Baker. Yes, absolutely. Another fabulous, fabulous one. Yes. Perfect. I'm so and look, yeah, I, I'm always up for more resources. So are there are there books you want to mention as well? Um uh, so, okay, what, yeah, Harriet Brown's Body of Truth was, like, life-changing for me. Okay. Yes. Like, on a personal level, that one was life-changing for me. And, um, you know, clearly, any of the people that I just mentioned, all of their books. Go buy all of their books. Um, and, uh, oh, yeah, and buy my book. But my book is, um, you know, if you're going through or you're in recovery, please, please be aware, even though there isn't a content warning on it, it is um, detailing of the whole experience and it may be triggering and it is filled with the horrors of diet culture that are associated with that show. So be aware before you pick it up. Okay, cool. Well, look, this has been wonderful. If there's any other resources or anything that you, you think of afterwards, I can put them all in, in the show notes. Um, oh, beautiful. If people want to be finding out more about you or more about your book, where where should they be going? Um, the book is on Amazon, and it is Losing It by Kai Hibbard, so you can just look it up. Um, also, you can find me usually at kaihibbard.com, but again, um, you know, if you message me on there, I'll get back to you, but as far as updating content all that often, um, you know, this isn't my whole life. My um, my social work and my kid and my family are my whole life. I'm trying to look for that balance because, as I said before, moderation is not my best. So I'm still working on that. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Kai, thank you so much for, for your time and, and for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. This was fantastic. Thanks for listening to Real Health Radio. If you are interested in more details, you can find them at the Seven Health website. That's www.7sevn-health.com.